Hello, good afternoon, everyone. How are you enjoying the conference so far? Been some great sessions. That's great. I agree. I have learned so much. And I mean, I know I work side by side with Courtney every day, but I'm telling you, this is a pretty incredible conference and some really great content. So kudos to you guys. Good job, Courtney. We've got some great speakers. We're very lucky that we could gather some really quality folks who are able to, to speak to all these different facets of asthma. I'm learning a lot too especially the clinical side, which I'm a little less familiar with, so. This is like priming me. I have a podcast recording coming up next week and I had actually air quality to talk about. We're doing some green space discussion and the importance of parks and in urban areas. And I had um, air quality um, as a topic to talk about. So talking about the social determinants of health in the last breakout was great. Antonia, like, this, this is Sheila with EPA. And uh, one of my areas that I focus on is vegetative barriers and air quality. So uh, we may want to talk because we're doing Absolutely. a lot of research studies on uh, the use of vegetative barriers next to major roadways, especially since so many schools are, are located in those um, locations. So, Absolutely. Yes. I will post my um, email in the chat once the session gets started. Um, I would love to, to meet and discuss more. With the Hoosier Health and Wellness Alliance, we've been focusing on um, parks board development and creating recreational spaces for communities to use. Um, and so I'd love to connect. That sounds great. Okay, well, we are promptly at 1240, so I do not want to hold up our session today. I'm Antonia Sawyer. I lead the Hoosier Health and Wellness Alliance and I'm part of the Connections and Health team alongside Alia Amin, who has been a host for you in breakout sessions, as well as Courtney Stewart. So welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to Air Quality, Asthma, and COVID-19. This topic could not be more relevant, so I'm really excited for today. I have made sure that the session is recording, so my first duty is complete. Second, I would like to introduce our two speakers. First, we have Monica Pagia. She is an environmental scientist with the US Environmental Protection Agency. Wow. Over 20 years experience at the EPA, she has worked as a chemist analyzing environmental samples for PCBs and pesticides, and as the quality assurance coordinator for ambient air monitoring. She currently serves as the asthma program coordinator. She relies on strong partnerships with state, local, and tribal asthma programs to maximize efforts in raising awareness and educating the public about environmental asthma management. As the mother of three girls, two whom have asthma, Monica understands the significance that asthma management education has on controlling asthma. Incredible, incredible bio. Sheila Badka, she is also a presenter today. She is an environmental engineer with the EPA. Her educational background is in mechanical engineering and biology, and she has an MSPH. She started in the EPA's Region 5 office as an air quality modeler for state implementation plans and moved to the radiation and indoor air programming in the mid-90s to work on programs addressing the management of school air quality and environmental conditions for those living with asthma. She has had temporary assignments in Region 5 material management and in EPA's diesel school bus emissions reduction programs. Sheila continues to collaborate with many school partners and communities on EPA's non-regulatory air programs and supports air-focused research projects. Wow, everybody strap on your seatbelts and get ready for an amazing, amazing presentation by these two phenomenal experts. Uh, without further ado, I will let you take it away. Oh, thank you, Antonio. What an uh, introduction. I hope we can live up to, to that. Um, so thank you and Jack um, for having us and for all of you attending today's um, presentation. Um, so Sheila and I, yeah, well, first of all, I wanna say, let's see if I can move through these slides. Um, so trick. How do I move forward my slides? If you click the screen, will it let you advance? 
No, let me see if I, uh, are you guys just seeing, what are you seeing? I'm sorry. We see a presenter preview. If you go to slideshow and maybe hit from the first slide and see if it'll let you advance. Courtney, do you have any? So this is the slideshow. I so um, Monica, at the very bottom oh. of your, do you see yeah, the I arrows? See it now. Yeah, I do yeah, see they're it now. kind of hidden. I had to reload. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, so not everything presented today reflects the views of EPA, nor does EPA endorse any commercial products or non-EPA web links. Um, neither Sheila nor I have any personal financial or commercial interest in what's being presented today. Um, this is a general outline of what we're going to be covering. We're covering both outdoor air and indoor air quality as it relates to asthma and COVID-19, and we'll be sharing lots of resources along the way. Um, I understand that there will be some overlap of what's already been said this morning, but we do hope to provide um, supplemental or more detailed information on specific topics. And I'm just gonna let Sheila kind of jump right in and talk about outdoor air quality. Thanks, Monica. And um, like Monica said, this is kind of um, some of the overlaps. I missed Dr. Krupp's uh, keynote, I apologize for that but it sounds like she probably touched on a lot of what we're talking about. And of course, Lisa Caldwell in her earlier session and just the recent session, Dr. Avril, I think we'll, you'll see some um, consistent themes coming across here. And we may dive in a little bit more deeply in the short time and apologies if we run through this quickly, but we wanna get as much information to you as possible. So, you know, very basically, we always start off with the slide on you know, what's the difference between air pollution and air quality? Because people have been using those terms interchangeably sometimes. And just to focus that when uh, we're talking about outdoor air, uh, the air pollution is, you know, a contaminant or a mixture of contaminants um, that uh, are found in the air and they can harm humans, plants, animals, and the environment like lakes and rivers. Of course, air pollution is found indoors as well, but um, the outdoor air pollutant sources are kind of categorized when, uh, into four main categories. Um, it can occur from natural events like volcanoes and uh, lightning creates ozone. You've got mobile sources that are uh, fossil fuel combustion vehicles like uh, trucks and buses. You've got stationary sources, which are like the larger, um, um, power plants and industrial sources. And then you have air, what is considered area sources. And these can be found, you know, when you look in an, at a city, they have, they, you have multiple things close together, like uh, lots of gas stations, lots of dry cleaners, and all of those pollutants is in an area contributing, as well as when you're in the rural location, you may have a farm that has livestock or fertilizer. Air quality, is, is the concentration, it's how much pollution is actually in the air. And we're gonna focus a little bit about the air quality um, in next. So um, next slide, please, Monica. So um, first, I just wanna to touch on the fact that EPA's authority to work on air pollution is through our Clean Air Act. And um, we've started doing this, uh, um, regulating, the criteria, what we call the criteria pollutants, and those are listed on the left-hand side. The only one that's not listed there is lead, but um, we started um, uh, setting standards and they're called the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or we shorten them to the word NACs. Um, and over the years, we keep revisiting them. They become um, more stringent. We learn more about the health effects and um, what we're gonna actually focus on in this discussion is the particulate matter and the ozone. We also um, have um, regulatory authority over the hazardous air pollutants, what we know as HAPS, there's 187 of them. And those are um, also regulated on a different section. We're not gonna discuss that, but I just thought it would be good for your, uh, the audience to know about. Next slide, please. So before we talk specifically about the two criteria pollutants of particulate matter and ozone, I just wanted to highlight a lot of times people aren't sure of how these things come about. We use the terms um, primary pollutants and secondary pollutants. Um, 
primary pollutants get emitted directly into the air from a source. So you might have a mobile source um, or a stationary uh, source that's putting out um, uh, volatile organics or particulate matter. Um, larger PM is considered a primary source, but secondary pollutants, they're not directly emitted from a specific source, but sources will um, emit um, various pollutants and it'll be formed in the environment through reactions in the air. So these types of pollutants include fine particulate matter, which is very small. We'll talk a little bit more about the size uh, differentiation in a bit, but then um, ozone. So if you look at the two uh, lists of sources for both PM and the sources that contribute to the formation of ozone, you'll see a lot of similar sources like mobile sources and utilities or um, uh, industries. Next slide, please. So what is particulate matter? It's a mixture of solid particles and liquid droplets and it's found in the air. And um, sometimes you can see it like when a um, diesel truck is accelerating, you'll see sometimes the puff of uh, smoke coming off of this uh, exhaust. Um, sometimes you can't see it, it's, it's uh, microscopic. And we have an example on the left hand side of uh, what a um, PM and we see PM10 and PM2.5. Um, a human hair is 50 to 70 microns in diameter. Now mic uh, micron or micrometer is a unit of measure and it's about a, th it's a thousand times smaller than a millimeter. So we're re talking really, really small. When we're talking PM10, that is um, particulate matter that is less than 10 microns in diameter. So you can see in the blue dots, on the human hair, a lot of PM10 um, particles can fit around a human hair. Even finer on that PM10, we have the PM2.5 or 2.5 microns or less in diameter. The PM10 is typically dust, mold, pollen, while PM2.5 is much finer organics, combustion particles, and why this is important is because on the uh, right-hand side, we have a, um, a graphic of the respiratory system. The larger particles might get caught up in your upper respiratory system, but as you move down through the respiratory system, you'll see uh, finer particles like 2.5 getting into the upper lower respiratory system. The inhalable particles, which are uh, less than one micron, get down into the alveoli. And the ultrafine, which is a 0.1 micron or 100 nanometers, actually get into your uh, bloodstream and can travel through to your organs uh, like your heart. Next slide, please. So ozone. Um, ozone is three oxygen. Now we inhale ox um, oxygen, but we inhale um, O2, uh, two oxygen. People kind of get confused. We talk about um, good ozone, bad ozone. They've heard about that. We want to protect the ozone layer. Well, Ozone layer in the stratosphere, which is well above our breathing zone, it's above where our planes fly, um, is uh, naturally occurring. And it's the protective layer um, for, to protect us from the sun's UV rays. Down at the ground level on the right-hand side, we refer to that ozone as bad ozone. And that is actually a secondary pollutant, which is created. Um, it's, it's formed when volatile organics that might come from personal care products, from factories, from vehicles, um, combine with oxides of nitrogen or NOx in the form of combustion um, and uh, come from combustion sources, I'm sorry, in heat and sunlight. So it's a summertime pollutant associated and it will be formed. That is unhealthy because it is such a um, reactive molecule in our lungs that um, we do not want to be breathing it. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so this is um, 
you know, air pollution does cause environmental damage, like reducing visibility, it causes acid rain, it damages forests, agriculture, and wildlife. Um, but again, we're going to be focusing on the health, uh, health effects on humans. Exposure to air pollution has been associated with a wide range of human health effects, including increased respiratory symptoms, hospitalization, and even premature death. Um, particulate matter, or PM, can affect both your lungs and your heart, while ozone primarily affects the lungs and worsens asthma and other lung diseases. Um, people with heart or lung disease, children and older adults are most likely to be impacted by PM and ozone. And uh, we talked a little bit about hazardous air pollutants. So these are air toxics like formaldehyde, asbestos, and mercury. These are known or suspected to cause cancer, birth defects, impaired lung function, and damage to the immune system. Uh, links between air pollution and childhood asthma. EPA has been involved in studies looking at the links between air pollution and child, childhood asthma. The first study I'm mentioning here, EPA collaborated with investigators at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill to study the health impact of ozone on African-American children who had moderate to severe persistent asthma. They live in the Raleigh, North Carolina area. The results demonstrated that ozone exposures at levels lower than the, our standard uh, was associated with pulmonary changes in these children with persistent asthma. Um, in a second study funded in part by EPA, researchers from Johns Hopkins found that children exposed to outdoor coarse particulate matter, so we're talking about PM between 2.5 and 10 microns, were more likely to develop asthma and need emergency room or hospital treatment for it. I um, mean, this is significant because exposure to PM 2.5 is typically what's associated with the development of asthma, while coarse PM uh, was thought to be less harmful. However, P coarse PM can indeed deposit into the airways, and recent research suggests that long-term exposure may be associated with cardiovascular and respiratory disease. Um, and then the third study funded by EPA provides evidence suggesting that air pollutants suppress genes and regulate the immune system, um, regulate, regulates the immune system's ability to differentiate uh, between an allergen and a dangerous foreign substance like a virus or bacteria causing the immune system to go into action, which then leads to asthma. Um, this is a link that directs you to more information about these studies. And along with these slides, we will, providing, we'll, we will be providing a one pager with all of our resources, because there's a lot. <laughs> so, um, and so, you know, the question is, so what is the relationship between outdoor air pollution, asthma, and COVID-19? I mean, as we just discussed, exposure to poor outdoor air quality impacts health specifically respiratory and cardiovascular health. Uh, we also know that minority and poor communities are disproportionately affected by air pollution. And this is um, likely because pollution sources tend to be located near disadvantaged communities. Um, studies have also found an increased rates of COVID-19 in areas with higher air pollution. And um, this makes sense since we know that exposure to air pollution contributes to poor heart and lung health. It can suppress the immune system, making these people more susceptible to COVID-19 infection. We also know that people with comorbidities like heart disease and diabetes are also more likely to have severe COVID symptoms. Similarly to how the uh, burden of asthma in the United States falls disproportionately on Black, Hispanic, and Native American people, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted these health inequities and the factors that contribute to it. Um, so not only like environmental issues, but discrimination, healthcare access, housing, education, income, and occupation. Um, people in racial and ethnic minority groups often work in essential settings. Um, and again, a list of our resources and re references here if you wanna take a deeper dive into this. Um, and so that leads us to the next question, how, uh, how can we better take control of our exposure to poor air quality? And I'm gonna turn it over to Sheila to tell us more about that. Thanks, Monica. So we talked a, about uh, the NACs and, you know, we've got all those criteria pollutants and, you know, I, we could do a really deep dive on how all these different criteria pollutants have standards for different averaging time periods based on different health effects. And it starts getting really confusing for the, you know, average person and for even us. So to try to explain the health messaging and what this information is. Um, this air quality index, 
the AQI was developed in order to better understand and better convey information to people about how the air quality is in their community and what's the health messaging. So, you know, basically for each air pollutant that was in those, uh, and we're going to ozone and PM, um, uh, for each air pollutant, an air quality index value of 100 relates to kind of an ambient air concentration that equals the max for protecting public health. So again, that's a mouthful. So when you look at this chart, I mean, simplistically, it's easy to say green is good because it's well below that 100 threshold. You see the 100 threshold in this AQI index at orange, okay? So it gives us kind of an easy way through these categories to give health messaging to equate it to a value. And it allows them people to know quickly what is the air quality and what should they be doing and in order to protect themselves if it is poor air quality. Now, I think I'm trying to remember who everybody may have been talking about the wildfires out West. And, and it was interesting a few weeks ago, I was actually driving out west um, across Minnesota and the wildfires that were up in Manitoba and Ontario created this, this swath of haze across the whole state of Minnesota as I was driving. And typically that's very clear drive. Um, you're in the rural locations, but it was hazy. And I'm sure it, you know, I didn't actually look up the air quality index at that time, but I'm sure it was orange or um you know, further down the color spectrum. So um, the, the wildfires, they've been seeing reds and, and I'm not sure about maroons, but I wouldn't be surprised if somebody said that. So this is just a really quick and easy way. Next slide, Monica. Um, the Air Now is actually a website that kind of compiles all the information and this is a multi-agency um, partnership. It's not just EPA, it's also NOAA, it's the National Park Service, it's NASA, it's CDC, and it's all the state and local air quality agencies and the tribal organizations that put in information. And it's kind of the one-stop source for all your air quality needs. So um, if you're looking for the information on the air quality index or specific air quality data, this website has this. So next slide. So where does all that air quality data come from? Well, the states and local air agencies or environmental agencies, as well as the tribal organizations have monitors across the country. And they um, follow EPA's federal monitoring methods and they upload the data. And as you can see, there's um, data that comes in from Canada. The State Department also has a lot of information coming from the embassy because uh, the embassy staff need to know. And so you can select the data, whether it's PM 2.5 or it's ozone. And there's a lot of information here at this website and I'd encourage you to play around with it. So next slide. Um, again, um, just kind of showing you where you can go. The Air Now also has an app, um, but then you can also get emails through EnviroFlash, um, and then you can find it online um, or on the weather forecast. Next slide. Um, of course, Indiana and Indianapolis has their own program. And I, I can't remember, I can't remember if it was Lisa, Dr. Everill mentioned Nozone. And, um, the Indianapolis program of uh, the air quality awareness. You can sign up for that. Indiana Department of Environmental Management on the right-hand side has their information of the monitoring network and their own um, outreach efforts. Next slide. Okay, um, so to, to wrap up our kind of discussion on outdoor air quality, again, just some general considerations to take uh, for those who have asthma when they're exposed to outdoor air quality for outdoor air quality is to check your local air quality using the various ways that Sheila just mentioned, um, schedule outdoor activities uh, when the outdoor air quality is better. Obviously stay inside when it's not good and make sure the windows are closed and then work with your healthcare provider 
to develop your ESMA action plan and identify triggers. Um, so now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and um, talk about indoor air quality, ventilation, filtration, um, all that stuff. And I'm gonna let Sheila lead us in that discussion. Okay, so if anything, Lisa, I'm, I'm acknowledging the fact that you and Dr. Avril and I'm sure others have talked about this, you know, and, and um, Lisa covered an incredible amount of in specific information and, we um, often, um, you know, want to remind people kind of of the importance, you know, reiterate we're spending so much time indoors and that the indoor sources of pollution are, you know, have the same, the, you know, they have particles like we find in outdoor air. They have gases like we find in outdoor air. So we want to be able to manage those um, pollutant sources and you know, in general, I know Lisa gave some really, you know, outstanding specific examples, but we kind of always like categorize um, messaging on the um, need to like control actual pollutants, you know, generally through elimination and substitution and, and you know, things like you want to select uh, cleaning products that have lower volatile organics or you want to eliminate tobacco in, in homes. Um, the, the ventilation side of things is both bring, bringing in outdoor air that's clean um, and filtered um, to dilute what's going on indoors, or you want to directly exhaust um, that, um, those pollutants that are building up um, using the um, exhaust fans in the bathrooms, using uh, range hoods you know, that exhaust outside or you want to make sure that appropriate filtration and air cleaning is happening uh, within the environment and that you're not contributing. Uh, next slide, please. And I see our time is coming quickly. So um, this is just, uh, I appreciate that. I'm going to quickly slide, go through these slides because uh, we wanna make sure there's time for questions, but um, we were asked to talk about how do we address indoor air to improve asthma symptoms and reduce the risk of COVID? So the focus has been primarily on ventilation. So we are increasing the ventilation as a layered approach of other uh, ways to protect ourselves from COVID. We increase the ventilation with outdoor air, as long as the outdoor air quality is deemed safe. This has been an issue with um, our counterparts out West with wildfires. But then with filtration, we want to make sure, in, and especially in schools, if you're working with your school district, um, and Lisa, I think, had shared a link in the chat let, uh, the last uh, session about some of the uh, funding available for schools to make sure that they can upgrade their filtration and some of their systems to make sure that their uh, um, um, ventilation systems are working so that the filters fit properly, that if you're using portable air cleaners, um, make sure that they're not um, uh, put producing ozone on, and that they're actually just a supplement to the HVAC system and then run fans and hoods. Next slide. Okay, I'm not even gonna go through this, but this actually talks a little bit more about uh, reminders about uh, the importance of air cleaning um, and what you need to know about portable air cleaners. Uh, make sure they're um, high efficiency um, HEPA filters or and that they're not contributing again, um, that uh, you don't want things putting ozone into a room or uh, any other detrimental um, issues. Um, next slide. Um, this is just as we talk with um, groups about you know the importance of ventilation in schools, especially, we want to remind people that a, an HVAC system is very equivalent to a respiratory system, that you're bringing air into uh, the building, you're mixing it much like our respiratory systems where you're bringing oxygen in, the mixing chamber similar to our lungs, the fans similar to the heart where it's delivering the oxygenated um, air to the classrooms, to the pupils, like, much like our organs and cells are getting the oxygen. Uh, the return air is going out the exhaust, much like air, um, the return um, uh, gases are going through our veins and out. Next slide, Monica. Yes, um, so cleaning and disinfecting have been topics of discussion since the beginning of the pandemic. 
We do, we do know now that surface transmission is low compared with direct contact, droplet transmission, or airborne transmission. However, proper cleaning and disinfecting is still important to better manage asthma triggers like dust, other viruses, and the use of these chemical irritants. Um, cleaning refers to reducing germs and dirt by using soap and water. EPA has resources to help you determine which products best suit your needs. Uh, more than 2,000 cleaning products currently qualify for the Safer Choice label. This is a voluntary program that companies can choose to request participation in. Uh, before a product can carry this label, EPA reviews all chemical ingredients. Um, each ingredient must meet strict safety criteria for both human health and the environment. Um, disinfecting refers to the use of chemicals to kill germs. We typically um, advise that you want to clean first and then disinfect. Um, so EPA has a list N of disinfectants specifically for use against SARS-CoV-2. This webpage contains a search searchable table of over 500 products that EPA has vetted for use against SARS-CoV-2. And there is a mobile version as well. Um, some things I, I definitely wanna highlight here. So you wanna be careful using disinfectants and cleaners around people with asthma, um, cleaning and, and and disinfecting products can irritate the lungs and trigger an asthma attack. You wanna make sure you're not using these products if possible around people with asthma, um, especially be careful using products with bleach. It is a known asthma trigger. Uh, try avo avoiding overuse of these chemicals, um, especially with those with long, uh, strong odors. And even naturally derived products, they can trigger asthma. Just because a product is considered natural or plant-based does not necessarily mean that it's um, completely safe to use around sensitive people. Uh, don't ask children or students to apply disinfectants. This was, you know, my children have come home and said that they've been asked by their teachers to do this. Um, unfortunately, we've gotten lots of reports from schools asking, uh, of schools asking students to disinfect um, their workspaces. Disinfectants are powerful chemicals. They can harm children's health um, if stored incorrectly. Children of any age, not just young children, should not apply disinfectants and should be kept out of children's reach. Uh, the reason we stress the importance of this is because children's bodies and minds are still developing. Chemical exposure can disrupt this development. Um, and the use of UV lights, generators, ozone generators, foggers, electrostatic sprayers, um, and other pesticidal devices can be considered risky or ineffective. Unlike pesticide, uh, chemical pesticides, EPA does not routinely review the safety or efficacy of these devices. Um, so if you do choose to use it, we just advise that you use them according to the directions and the precautions that they, that they give you. And then again, chemical irritants are asthma triggers. Always follow the product's direction for use. Use the least amount possible. Um, stop using it if asthma symptoms get worse, switch to another one. You wanna make sure that you're ventilating the space and then um, again, work with your healthcare provider. And I think we're at the end. So these are just some of the takeaways. You know, we threw a lot of information at you. If anything, this is what we want you to get out of it. Um, outdoor air pollution comes from natural and man-made man sources. Uh, we did discuss more ozone and PM exposure to outdoor air. Uh, does affect asthma, may increase the risk of viral infections like SARS-CoV-2, and then you want to just check your local air quality using the various ways we shared today. And for, in terms of indoor air quality, proper ventilation and filtration can reduce asthma triggers and SARS-CoV-2 in the air, and then use EPA's safer choice products that are list and disinfectants against SARS-CoV-2, and when using cleaning disinfectant chemicals, always follow the directions and precautions given. Um, so that's really all we have. Let me see here. So again, thank you to the uh, Indiana Joint Asthma Coalition and for all of you for joining us. Feel free to ask any questions. Thank you so much, doc Dr. Figia and Dr. Radka for your presentation. Extremely, extremely informative. And yes, you lived up to your introduction. This was absolutely brilliant. Um, and I open it to the floor for anyone that is in our session today to ask questions or have any comments.
I do just want to correct you. We are not doctors. We oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You are muted. I didn't know if anyone was saying anything. If there are, oh, here's a question. Are there any up and coming asthma funding from the EPA? Um, so, you know, here in region five, so we serve six states, we usually get a small pot of money. By small, I mean like 25K. So it's not a lot, um, but we do, you know, from time to time get some funding. Um, I know uh, our EJ program also gives out funding to address asthma. Um, and, and headquarters usually does one, but it's more on a national level. Yes, and so Monica. Five years. Yes, Sheila, go ahead and step in. And sometimes if people come to us, and usually again, it's under the 25K, but they have a really good project um, that they, you know, just need additional funding for the environmental component or something. We sometimes can approach our air division person and it's, uh, you know, it varies on when she may or may not have money. And um, so if there is a specific project that benefits the environmental management of asthma information, you know, it's, it's not just information generating, but it's, you know, making a real impact, sometimes we are able to justify. So, you know, like Monica said, we get a little bit of money, some, you know, designated, but sometimes if there's a good project and especially, you know, related to EJ or, or other things, um, you know, so contact us, you know, and Lisa, you have our number, I know. Are there any other questions? And we may want to put that, I, I think Lisa dropped uh, the um, America Rescue Funds on the, the schools in, was it in the last chat? And we may want to just make sure we have that dropped into this chat. If we can, if Lisa, you have it handy, that might be relevant. Um, and I do want to just let, I guess, Courtney know that we added a, an additional slide to this presentation. Um, so it's slightly different from what we had uh, uploaded to you guys. Uh, so I will share this new, newest version and then also our one pager with all the resources with you. Thank you so much. Really great presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you all.